Um, everybody can hear me pretty loud. Um, I am not your typical bioinformatician. Uh, I do not program, nor do I want to. <laughs> um, I don't have a very extensive math background, but what I did love is I love biology. And when I was getting my PhD, that's about when uh, microarrays came out. And, you know, I was doing my, I don't know, I think it was my 110th RT-PCR, and <laughs> I thought, wow, this technology, we can look at everything at the same time, you know, I'm totally going to do this. So basically, I, you know, I, I really jumped into that at the University of Wisconsin. I, uh, you know, kind of picked up the math and um, uh, computer skills that I needed, but honestly, I do not program. And that's why I use software like I'm going to demonstrate to you today. I think all of you should be looking at your own data. <laughs> you are the experts in your field. You know, it, it kills me. You know, I do all these projects where I see people's projects and they spent thousands upon thousands of dollars on their, you know, study. They've trained postdocs and they've cried because you pushed them too hard. And, at the very end of this, you know, this emotional, you know, thing, they just hand it off to somebody to interpret. You know, for me, I want to interpret my own data, or at least I want to get the biology out of it. And so what I'm going to talk to you today is uh, basically give you some, some ways to do that. And what I'm going to show you is you don't even need your own data. That what I hope I get across to you today is that the true power of bioinformatics is not to analyze your data, but to analyze everybody else's data because there's a ton of it out there. Okay. So again, you know, I don't really see myself as a number cruncher, more like a data wrangler, <laughs> if you will. That I kind of consider all this information out there as pixels, right? If you look at a standard TV, it has about 2 million pixels in it, or boxes. Actually, 4K has way more, but not my TV. <laughs> you got 2 million basically boxes, you know, and you, we watch this, right? You know, Oscars are coming up, right? You can put these into pictures and they can make you laugh and you, they can make you cry, but in essence, all you're watching are boxes. And in essence, actually, all those are just zeros and ones. So I, I, for my job, what I, I do is, you know, I see my, my role is to take all these pictures, all this data out there and put together a picture that somebody can understand. Gene lists don't cut it. They don't really tell you anything. So what I'm trying to do is get to the biology of this. Uh, before I do, sorry, before I do uh, disclaimers, you never know what's going to come out of my mouth, so I have to say that all these opinions are mine, and <laughs> not a luminous. <laughs> don't throw anything at them. Uh, also, they do not pay me, uh, but I do get compensated for travel when I speak at their events. And um, I always... After the events, I always try to find out where they're going because, you know, they have the corporate card and so I usually get some drinks and supper. So, what are you guys doing tonight, Tom? <laughs> okay. Um, so, before I get into all this, what I'm going to have to do is tell you a story about all this new technology. I'm going to have to tell you a story about a bull about 100 years ago, a contest to basically how much a bull weighed or the processed meat from the bull. And the guy who did that was Sir Francis Galton. Anybody here that has not heard my talks heard of Sir Francis Galton? No, never. <laughs> I'm trying to bring him back, I swear, but it just never happens. Well, he was, he was in his 90s. Um, he basically, uh, he was also um, uh, Charles Darwin's cousin. He did a lot of things. And if I had more time, I, he, he was a fascinating character, kind of a crank. Also, uh, the father of eugenics. And actually, in relationship to this cow, he was going to prove his eugenics theory. Um, I don't know if anybody's heard of it. Has anybody heard of the wisdom of crowds? Maybe, sort of, yeah, a little bit. Uh, so at this fair, they were auctioning off the processed meat of a bull. They weren't actually auctioning off. They were having a contest. Who could guess the weight? And in order to do this, in order to enter the contest, you had to pay some money. There was about 800 guesses. And these included lay people, but it also included butchers and farmers and people that are actually very skilled at, you know, probably understanding how much weight or how much meat is going to come off a bull. He saw this, Galton saw this and thought, oh, this is going to be, you know, proof of my eugenics. I'm going to take all these people, these experts, 
and they're going to be way more accurate than the crowd, the lay people. So he did that, you know, so the experts, a small group, but then he had the lay people large that were going to make this guess. <coughs> so he took everybody's guesses. He was, a, he was knighted by then, so I think <laughs> the contest is like, here, take it, whatever you want. So he took all the guesses and he looked at everybody's, he, everybody's answers, and no one actually got the weight of the bull, right? A lot of people were hot, too high, a lot of people were too low. But here is the fascinating part. And he actually looked at even his experts, and his experts weren't accurate. What, this was kind of the aha moment, is when he looked at all this data, he found that if you took the mean or the median of this data, it was within 1% one, 1 of the actual weight of the bull. Right? And this was, came to a surprise to him. He was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this worked. <laughs> you know, I thought... You know, my experts were going to be way more accurate when I take everybody's guess, when everybody's looking at the same thing and I take the middle of that, that's pretty dang accurate. Also, he said, well, you know, this is a pretty interesting phenomenon. Maybe we should, you know, study this a little more. By the way, he published this in Nature. You can look this up online. I think it's, what is a JSTOR or when they have a, uh, yeah, but it's, it's like a page and a half. It's also called, and he, he titled it too, Vox Populi, which I love is the voice of the people. If I ever have a rock band, that's going to be my name. <laughs> Actually, there is one. They're not very good. <laughs> I hope there's no Vox Populi fans out there. But ever since then, obviously, the, the stuff works, and people have been using it. Um, there was a recent book out. Um, I think it was on the... Um, uh, New York Times bestseller list for a while, Wisdom of Crowds by James Sirawecki. Um, kind of talks about, you know, how all kinds of people are using this information. Anybody here heard of Nate Silver? Yes? No? Maybe? Uh, 538 is the website. He's actually a famous statistician, which is kind of an oxymoron because you never <laughs> hear that. So anytime there's a famous statistician, we're all about him. But actually, in 2012, he predicted almost every major election in this country. Do you think he asked anybody who they were voting for? I'm going to answer that for you. No, he did not. All he did was take all the polls out that were out there. Some were obviously biased left. Some were obviously biased right. Took the average of all those polls and was able to predict all the, the elections in 2012. He didn't do so well in 2016. <laughs> Um, and there's his website, 538. It's a great data analytics site. I love, I love that website. Um, but also, the CIA is using wisdom of crowds, right? They'll actually go get a bunch of lay people and they'll ask them geopolitical questions like, do you think Russia is going to invade Ukraine in two months? Right? And they'll do their own research and go out there and basically put a probability on, on the odds of Russia, say, invading Ukraine. What they found, the CIA, is if they get all these people to give that guess and they take the average of that, it's more accurate than the experts they've had there for like 20 years, right? There is something to this, is that it's not about the outliers, and that's what I think what's great about the, the Gal Galton thing is, you know, his whole thing was eugenics, you know, the outliers are, you know, where it's at. But honestly, it, you know, it's the average of everybody that's, you know, which is the true answer. But there are requirements for this, for the wisdom of crowds. Uh, diversity, you have to have lots of different people making guesses. Um, if you have the same people guessing, they're just going to make the same kind of guesses. Independence, everybody makes their un, uh, own uninfluenced decision. Um, uh, specialization, people are very knowledgeable in certain fields. So again, the diversity. But I mean, this is the key for biology, is the aggregation. You know, how do we take all these people to different opinions, these guesses, and how do we take the average of that? How do we use all, these inf all this information? Well, and, you know, I'm not going to talk about bulls today, <laughs> unless you want me to. Yes? Can you use this to predict the stock price? <laughs> no. No, Gal, I'm not going to get you rich. <laughs> that is, yeah, maybe, actually, you probably could. Maybe. Yeah, it could be. I don't know. Read the book. There's, 
they do all kind. There's all kinds of ways people are trying to use wisdom of crowds. You know, I, I don't think you need to go there. Just get a bunch of people to ask questions. Yes, correct. Well, I'm going to tell you right now. There is a ton of crowds at Gene Expression Omnibus. Everybody heard of Gene Expression Omnibus? This is where we're depositing all of all of our genomics data, or all our omic data, basically. And if we look right now, actually this is probably a couple months ago, there is almost a hundred thousand different studies in geo, right? With 2.5 million samples. That's a big crowd. And what I hope to convince you is that there's all kinds of cures in this crowd right now. <laughs> That you don't even have to do other experiments. What you can do is mine what's already been done and get loads and loads of information. And that's basically what we're going to do today. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is a project I did with a rare kidney cancer, papillary renal cell carcinoma. And uh, actually, um, I, I've worked with Illumina quite a bit. I've used Correlation Engine for a long, long time. Um, we were kind of looking for a project to kind of showcase their, um, their informatics division. And somebody contacted me. I have a YouTube channel. I'll give you the link at the end. Um, but through my videos, he, um, the Bill Paceman, who basically he organizes these hackathons in Silicon Valley. So they get medical people, engineers, computer science people, just kind of this diverse group to try to hack a disease. Um, he contacted me, said, hey, you know, I know you did some things on kidney cancer. How, you know, could you put some videos to kind of show how to use this in papillary renal cell carcinoma? So I got with Jim Flynn and Joe Delaney, and they kind of, what we did, decided is, you know, let's do this. Let's see what we can find about papillary renal cell carcinoma using the Illumina stuff without having our own data. So before that, you know, I have to kind of figure out like what the heck is papillary renal cell carcinoma. Um, and actually, most kidney cancer is clear cell carcinoma. So that's 75%. Uh, th these all, all these types of cancers mainly are associated with where the cancer rises in the kidney. Um, but what I'm interested in is the papillary type. So you have papillary type 1 which looks very different under the microscope. Um, it typically is associated with mutations in MET, MET gene. Um, it is, the survivability on that is much better. It's very, it's a lot easier to treat than this one over here, which is type two. Um, free, uh, a lot of times you'll see mutations in fumarate hydrodase gene uh, associated with this. And the prognosis is very much, much worse with this cancer. Oh, there it is. Okay. But the thing is, is kidney doctors basically treat both the same. So what I kind of want to do is, you know, look, you know, let's find all the information we can on this. And there's been some studies done. This was done in the New England Journal of uh, Medicine. But you can see lots of different samples. They had about 100 different papillary renal cell carcinoma samples. And what they noticed is that they kind of group into two major groups, that type 1 and type 2, but you also have subsets of the type 2 group. So here's C1, and you can, you know, different, you can see the mutations in MET down here associated with the C1. You have the 2A over here, which has mutations in this SETD2 gene. C2B, which also has, there's some methylation islands that seem to be specific to it. And then you have the worst type of papillary root uh, kidney cancer is the type 3C, or 2C, I'm sorry. And they have these metha methylation islands called KIMP, um, CPM island methylation phenotype. And no one would really care about the differences. And again, as I said, they pretty much treat all these cancers the same, except that the survivability in the C1 is much better in the C2A than the 2B, and then you can see with, it, with the 2C, much, much worse. So this was my goal is, you know, how can I go out there and get as much information as I can on papillary renal cell carcinoma and come up with something that, you know, can actually maybe 
help somebody, you know, an oncologist out there maybe treating the disease. And that's what we did. And so what I'm going to do now is take you through a demo where I use correlation engine and I put together this meta-analysis. So what I did was we found eight different papillary renal cell carcinoma studies looking at 17 different comparisons that are up here. Here are all the numbers of the test subjects. So these were the ones that would have the cancer and what it was compared to. These are all the control tissues. And then the number of genes that were differentially expressed. So this is my base that I'm going to work with. And what I'm going to do now is kind of show you how I put that together. Um, so this was briefly kind of, you know, uh, Lester, you know, kind of introduced this, but, you know, I'm going to talk about it a little bit as well. So again, this is the Illumina correlation engine. And the nice thing about Illumina is they know data. And I think, you know, for me to come up and tell you that, you know, the secret to bioinformatics is analyzing everybody else's data. Um, is, you know, how do you get to that, right? You can't download everybody's stuff. So this is basically what this allows you to do, this correlation engine, is they have already gone out into GEO and basically collected all the omics studies they possibly could, right? They formatted the data, they made sure the data made sense, and in actuality, I told you that there was 100,000 different studies in PubMed, right, or I mean in GEO right now, about, they were only be able to use about a quarter of it. So there's a lot of garbage out there. This is what makes Illumina nice, is they've gone through, they've basically taken all the data, they've done all the comparisons, they know all the variables associated with their studies, now they have all these gene lists. I can put my own gene list in there to compare to everything that's already been done, or I can actually generate my own gene list. And that's actually what, what I did. So it's very easy put it on curated studies, I want to find studies. And again, I have lots and lots of, I'm going to go through this kind of quickly, but I have lots and lots of videos that kind of show how you can actually get to this point. So I log in, curated studies, I'm going to look for kidney cancer. And as you type, certain phenotypes come up. That's what makes this database advantageous is it's curated very very well so it's very easy to search and to filter right so we started off we there was about 22,000 different studies in in correlation engine now that I've eliminated it or narrowed it down to kidney cancer we're up to we're down to 142 studies which is a lot to go through so what I can do is I can filter this even more so you hit organisms, um, I'm only concerned with people, and go to data types. In my personal opinion, I think RNA expression is where, it at, where it's at. I think a lot of people look at mutation status or, you know, to try to get a handle on genes or, or, or what, say, a cancer is doing. But I think the mRNA is in the middle of everything. You know, the protein expression, the, the genome, I think it's a very good way to kind of figure out what the cell is doing. So if I have a preference, I'm usually going to go for the RNA expression to kind of try to understand the system. So we hit that, and then I can hit keywords here. And since I'm only interested in papillary, I'm going to type papillary. And there's all kinds of papillary tissues out there, so I'm just not going to select one. I'm going to hit apply filter. Now we're down to 11 studies. And these 11 studies should have something to do with papillary renal cell carcinoma. This is, these are gonna be, this is the database that I'm drawing off of. And it's very simple to put together a meta-analysis. So I can go through here and basically pick these comparisons within this study. So in this particular study, they compared papillary renal cell carcinoma with poor survival to the same type with excellent prognosis, right? And in that comparison, they found 6,097 6, genes that were different. For me to basically take this and use this in my meta-analysis, I'm just going to click on this plus. 
I now own that gene list. I own, now have access to that study, and now I can incorporate it in anything I do. We can go down here and I can pick some more. Papillary cell, where's, there it is, right on the bottom. And that's basically what I did, is I just went through here and selected anything with papillary renal cell carcinoma. Again, when I got done, I ended up you basically utilizing 17 different gene lists out of eight different studies. And I'm gonna to go to my meta-analysis. You can see as I'm clicking, that number changes, and it's basically adding those studies here. And what you're basically going to see are these gene results. So these are the genes in those gene lists and whether it was differentially expressed. So let me actually get to the meta-analysis that I put together. What's very nice as well is that you can bookmark any of these pages. You can book your mark your meta-analysis, so I've already bookmarked this before. So again, here are my 17 different studies, papillary renal cell carcinoma. Here, and these are the gene lists. So in this particular gene, this TNF AIP6, it was upregulated significantly, and that's at a p-value of 0.05, and the absolute fold chain has to be greater than or less than 1.2 or negative 1.2. Yeah. Do you know those studies that use the microRenal NGS? What's that? This studies. Yeah, I, I should have told you that. This is actually a combination. The majority of these, 16 out of the 17 are RAE studies, and there's one RNA-seq study in here. Do you see any systematic difference when you compare these two platforms? You can. Um, RNA-seq tends to be a lot more sensitive. And I'm gonna tell you this right now, is if I had my, you know, if I got to choose what to analyze, I'm picking arrays over RNA-seq almost any day of the week. <laughs> arrays are much more accurate. <laughs> they really are. In that when you do RNA-seq for, when you're trying to quantitate, you know, RNA, you know, any message that takes up a month, you know, you only get so many reads. And then if you have something that's expressing a lot, say in a different cell type, it's gonna basically kind of mute everything else that you're trying to measure. So when you're actually trying to do statistics, it's, it's pretty horrible, it can be very horrible. So I like to use RNA-seq for when I'm looking at something that's very similar to each other, like a cell lines are very good, but as far as tumor tissue goes, RNA-seq's pretty bad. Okay, so, where am I here? Okay, so we have the data. <laughs> Now what we want to do is we want to see the gene results in these. Is there, was there another question? Okay. Well, is that the way you combine the array data versus the, uh, with the NGS data? Um, no, actually, so here's what they do is, is Illumina is really good about this. Like I said, I think RNA-seq is more sensitive, which makes it kind of a pain in the butt to do, you know, these quantitative kind of studies. but. What Illumina does, you'll see these bars here. So in each one of these studies, in each one of the bars represents a gene list that I put into my meta-analysis. And in this particular study, you know, papillary renal cell carcinoma versus normal kidney, it was upregulated and it was, the, it was ranked the 89th highest gene out of all those genes. What it does is the top ranked gene, it makes 100 for all these studies. And everything is basically down to zero for that. So everything actually gets, ends up getting put on the same plane. And I'll kind of show you, we're gonna open up this gene so you can kind of see what's going on here. You know, you can just go here. And then in these last three, I actually basically compared tumor or papillary renal cell carcinoma to itself. So these are actually comparisons against the tumor or to tumors against other tumors. But what I want you to notice is all this consistency here, right? All these different people, seven different studies, all across the country, different labs, 
different specialities, but they're all kind of seeing the same thing, right? Again, wisdom of crowd, I can get the average of all this. If we open this up here, this will tell you, and you can download anything, and that's what's really nice too, is say I don't care about all the genes. I just wanna know, I have my favorite gene, I wanna know what's doing in all these different studies. And that's exactly what you can do. So say I loved tumor necrosis factor alpha-induced. Like that's my favorite gene ever. And I do have favorite genes. Like you do this enough and like you get personal relationships with genes. It's like, oh man, nf -cap b oh, this thing's going down. Okay. But what you can do is you can open it. And again, all of these are different gene lists and it's telling you what that gene in this particular study, it went up 9.7 fold at a p-value of 4.3 times 10 to the negative 14th. And again, in all these studies, the same, and you can see this is, uh, I, I would imagine, I think this is the RNA-seq study, but you can see it's 50-fold here. But when you actually look at the bar, this bar is lower than this bar, even though the full change is higher. Again, we are putting everything on the same scale, okay? And again, you can search this, say I just want to know my favorite gene. What you can also do is look for biogroups. What biogroups, you know, biological groups are overrepresented in this, this, these genes? So I click on that. And again, I'm not using just one study to make these decisions, right? As if when it finally loads, come on, internet. When it finally loads, you can see vascular development. A lot of genes associated with that are actually going down with kidney cancer, with this papillary renal cell carcinoma. Except in the last two, which are the more severe forms of cancer compared to itself, and they're actually going higher. Again, this is telling me, given the fact that this vascular development is overrepresented in all my different gene lists, it's probably important in my system. Right? And it's not one study telling me this, it's eight different groups telling me this. And again, we can filter this many different ways. Say I just want to look at canonical pathways. I could look at micro microRNA targets. But this, again, this is giving you, this is telling you what that gene list means, right? And it's using text things that we've already decided are biological groups to do that. And I'm actually, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you that you can actually get beyond that. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna use actual other studies to actually compare to ours, right? If you actually look at the geo, like pathways out there, has anybody like looked at the references on those at all? They're like 20 years old, <laughs> like five different groups, maybe, you know, three different species, but, and then you look at like, so that's a reference for you know, humans. And then you look for mo the mouse version of that pathway, it's the same references, right? These pathways are wrong. <laughs> we can do better. And that, I think I'm gonna, what I'm gonna show you is I think we can get to that. So again, we can look here. This is telling me in those genes, that meta-analysis I created in papillary renal cell carcinoma, these are the things that are going on in those comparisons. Genes involved in cell cycle. I mean, it makes sense. DNA replication. There's some things that are very interesting. Homeostasis. We can filter by things that just go up or down. Here, oh, it's up there. Okay. But here's what I like is I want to get to this stuff here, and I can't really do that with a meta analysis. I'm going to talk to some of the Illumina people. Maybe they could do that. But what I want is I want I want this stuff. You know, I want a pharmacoatlas. I want a drug that maybe I can give, say, papillary renal cell carcinoma patients that will actually reverse the, the changes in gene expression that I'm seeing. Okay? So what you can do is when we get to gene results, is we can actually export all those genes. And that's what I did. So when you actually export it, what it will do is it actually give you 5,000 of those genes with its fold change, its p-value, and its normalized Illumina fold change. And that's really what I want. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make a data set out of this. 
So when you download it, it should look like this. So it'll be an Excel file, actually a CSV file, but you'll have all your data sets. This will tell you the comparison and the study that was used and all the bio sets. And then if you go down here, you can actually get a bookmark so you can recreate this. So all you have to do is put that um, URL into your browser and basically go back to exactly where you were and recreate that, that meta-analysis. And then here again, here are all our genes. Here's that MET or TNAF. It'll tell you how many lists it was differentially expressed. So a lot of these, and again, 17 out of 17 studies are telling me TNAF alpha A P6 is important, right? It's probably important. Okay, so you'll get an overall gene score, which kind of takes the average of all those. We'll have a score bio set, so this is the normalized value. You'll get a P value on the significance of that in that particular data set, and then you'll get an activity value, or that's the full change. What we can do and what I'm going to show you is we can actually just use the normalized values and basically create our own basically study. What I do is I take the normalized, these, uh, the bioset scores that Illumina gives since they're scaled and then I just make them either positive or negative based on the full change. And when you do that, okay, so now I'm leaving correlation engine. I think it's very important to have very, a lot of different tools when you're actually analyzing. You can't do everything with just one tool, so I use lots of different things to look at the data. One of these is Partech, so this is it's very important not only for you to you know, basically get gene lists, but to basically manipulate it and visualize it in different ways. So that's what I did, is I basically take, took the, here are all my, so all my different gene lists are in my rows. Dang it. As you look over here, here's all our gene expression. Again, these are the normalized values. And then it, either if it was if it significantly up, it was positive, or significantly down, it'll be negative. Right? So this is my crowd. These are 17 people, 17 different people telling me what the expression of this is, right? So when I do that, I can look at it, do a scatter plot. So here are, oh, here are all the different study names that I used, or the different studies, they're color coded. Hopefully you can see that. You know, that's kind of what I'm looking for. Is there a batch effect? And then here's what you find is, I mean, look, there's three different studies done by three different groups. They're all grouping together in, in the, everybody understands PCA plots or did I just jump like two levels? No, no everybody understands PCA plots, great. So basically you can use the gene expression or in this case the full change and plot these in uh, three-dimensional space. So anything that's close to each other resembles each, resembles each other from the, like the transcriptome Things that are far apart are more dissimilar. So you can see that. We can look at, you know, even though these are different platforms, different groups, they all look kind of similar. We can look at test, no, not test number. So this would be the type of papillary renal cell carcinoma I'm looking at. It'd be helpful if we had that, yep. As you can see, the lower grades kind of here, all grouped together. And then you can see the non-discriminant, this would be in the red, and then the green would be the type 2, so the more severe. Right? And you can see there's one type 2 that's right here, but that's actually the 2A, which in that previous graph that I showed you is much more like type 1 than it is type 2. You know, that's all we're doing is we're just kind of getting, you know, flavoring it. We can look at the subtypes now. You know, what are these two things back here? You know, we've got a head, uh, stop. Uh, the her hereditary forms of papillary renal cell carcinoma seem to be very dissimilar to everything else. And we could look at, you know, what is the, what are we comparing it to? This would be the control tissue. You can have normal and normal adjacent, and they seem to be very similar. 
And then you have these two done by two different groups, very, very similar profiles. I'm not saying they use the same RNA, but I'm just saying. <laughs> you find that a lot. A lot of times I'll analyze like a, uh, somebody's array study and the people they say are females and males are definitely not it. <laughs> and that happens a lot. I, I, was talking, I was talking to the Lumen people about that and they're like, yeah, you, you have no idea some of the stuff we come across. <laughs> I'm like, yes, I do. I unfortunately do. But that, again, that's what's nice is they've, they've done that for us. So scatter plots, you know, basically we're, we're, we're visualizing the data now. Again, I didn't create any of this. I just gathered this from eight different groups from across the country. We can actually, what I'll do, you know, I filtered it down to about 2,000. How are we doing on time? Okay, I'll try to hurry here. 2,000, just so we can see it. Everybody understands heat maps and hierarchical clustering, correct? Hopefully. Oh, Lord. Anything in yellow would mean that in that particular, so all of our different studies are in the columns. All the different genes that were differentially expressed in those columns are in the rows. What you can see here is that there's a lot of consistency. And we're also seeing that there's a lot of differences, or at least some differences between the type two and then the type one. And then we have some nonspecific that are probably a mixture. And this is one of the cool things that I find is, is that you find certain, like where I have this selected, it basically clustered there, right? These genes ha behave very similarly, so similar across all these different, 17 different comparisons. And these ones on the very end, I'm very interested with in that, you know, I'm looking at a severe form of the cancer compared to a less severe form. And these genes also tend to be higher. If I could, if the <laughs> Bartek was working, what I could show you is you could basically just zero in there and basically grab this cluster and grab all those genes. Okay? And that's what I did. So I think this is an interesting cluster given that it's, it's higher in the more severe forms. Let's see what it does. My hypothesis, it is that these genes are all connected. And actually... And when we throw them into string, so this is a networking program. Um, string stands for search tool for the retrieval of interesting, interacting genes and proteins. Has anybody heard of string before? Few people, yeah, some of the people I talked to. <laughs> it's free, by the way, free. And it's actually really good because uh, Europeans make the best tools. Like, they're so nice. Like, all the stuff associated with like GEO and NCBI are horrible to use, but yeah, socialists make good tools. So what you can do is you basically, we, I downloaded those genes that, I, that were in that cluster that seemed to be higher than more severe forms of papillary renal cell carcinoma. And what it's doing is it's showing me all the biological or any type of connection that it can find in its database. And as you can see, these things are really well connected. Right? If we go down here to the analysis, the odds of me getting all these connections by random chance are less than 1 times 10 to the negative 16th. Which is telling me that even though I grabbed a bunch of genes from seven different, different studies, or eight different studies, you know, they're not unrelated. This isn't just random noise. And what I'm pulling out are actually biological units. And what I would argue is that this is the true pathway uh, of these genes rather than anything you could probably look up, right? We can go down here and you can color it, right? You can say, you know, we color genes of cell cycle, DNA repair. Again, all of these are, are overrepresented in this list. And I would say that this cluster is associated with a lot of cell cycle, a lot of DNA repair. You know, we can cut response to stress. Uh, we go down... We can color, you know, most of these things are in the nucleus. And then Falconi anemia pathway for some reason. Lots of Falconi anemia. And I was like, what, what's going on there? Actually, it's it, those patients, people with that disease have a much higher incidence of cancer than 
the general population. But, but that's what we can do basically, is we can go in here and we can start grabbing some of these genes and we can actually download you know, the connections. You, know, you don't have to be, have a PhD to figure out like, maybe what's the most important thing in here. Right? The most important thing is probably the thing that's interacting with the most things on my list. And we can actually look here, Topor isomerase is one of those. Right? That actually has the most connections out of any of my list. You've got BRCA1. We can click on these and kind of look them up. Again, that's getting me kind of, I can take all those genes, I can make my own study, I can find clusters within that, and I can pull those out, and they can tell me a lot about the biology. This cluster is much higher in the more severe forms than the less severe forms. But again, now we can do the wisdom of crowd. Time. Okay. What we can do is with these, With this data analysis, now that I have these, I can basically take, again, do the wisdom of crowd, I take the average of all these columns, right? Here's this gene, here's what everybody, you know, these 17 different, say, individuals think this gene is doing, I take the average of that, now that's what my gene is doing in my data set, right? So, I'll, so what you do when you get done doing that, is I can take the mean of all those. So these are 2,000 genes. Again, that's the genes that I downloaded from Correlation Engine. I now have the mean normalized expression for each one of those genes. I can now shoot that back into Correlation Engine and start figuring stuff out. In my opinion, this gene list that I just created is better than any of the papillary renal cell carcinoma lists there. Because again, it's a combination of everybody and you're not relying on one thing or one person or one group to tell you everything. Okay, so what I can do it, and uh, they showed you how to kind of download it, and I'm not really gonna go off onto that, but if you look here, I've got it loaded, my data. So I'm putting all that stuff. So again, these are about, actually recognized uh, not quite 2,000 genes, so I'm putting in 1,995. Again, these are based on my average expression from my meta-analysis, and I actually took away the, uh, the studies that were looking at cancer versus cancer. So this is just an average of the cancer versus the control tissue. Click on this. You can see our genes here. Again, now we can go, we can start using some of these other tabs up here. Pathway to Richmond again, you can see what biological units are overrepresented in those. Right? And again, I said, I'm not too keen on what people said 20 years ago. You know, I'm more interested in say, you know, let's look at the knockdown. The nice thing about Lumina is they have access to all these knockdown studies out there. You know, we've pretty much knocked all the genes out in mice. And we have the results of, when I knock this gene out, what other genes does it affect? And what we can do is we can tie that to our gene list so that when I knock out this FLCN, it has a positive effect on the genes that I put in, right? So that means it's probably an inhibitory to actually this pathway, or at least the, the genes that I put in, papillary renal cell carcinoma. It's probably a tumor suppressor. Again, we can go through here and look at all these different things. Fumarate, hydrolase, cool. <laughs> I didn't notice that the first time I was looking through there. Yeah, again, that was the one that it's mutated in uh, type two. You'll see Matt will come up here. I think it's very important and I tell people this, and I don't know if they necessarily believe me, is that the really cool things about, like, if you get a gene list back, the most important things, in, you know, in a gene list are things that you probably don't measure. That I rarely measure changes in expression of P53 or NF-kappa-B or VEGF. 
what, you know, important molecules in your cell either get phosphorylated, they get translocated to the nucleus, you remove an inhibitor, but you don't have time to make more of it, right? So what you're looking for are things that affect lots of things in your gene list. And what I kind of consider my gene list is kind of the shrapnel of whatever bomb went off. And I'm trying to put the bomb back together and find those bombs. And these are some of those bombs that, that you can get from these gene lists. Uh, there's Pharmaco Atlas. This is great. And Leonard showed you a little bit on this, but so the Pharmaco Atlas, again, all these, they've downloaded all these studies. They have, a, they have a record of if a chemical was used in it. They know what genes change because of those chemicals. Now what you can do is find things that affect your genes of interest. Again, this is the idealized papillary renal cell carcinoma list. If you look here, we can rank these. And actually, if I wanted a therapy, Puticle, you know, like if I was a doctor, I mean, this would be what I want. I don't want to target one gene. I want to talk, target a panel of genes. If we look here, so there's a negative, this is VX always comes up, but there's, so what you can do is you can basically go here. So Imodin has a negative effect on my genes of interest. When we click on it, it'll go to those two studies. So it's actually two studies that are showing me this. So when I look, again, this is my idealized papillary real cell carcinoma list. It has a negative correlation. So this is the study, this is the gene list it's using. So here's my gene list. I have 730 going up and 1265 going down. Here's their gene list. Here's the genes that change with their chemical. There's 313 genes that are common. The odds of that happening are seven times 10 to the negative 23rd. But here's the interesting part is that when the gene in my study goes up, it goes down in their study or vice versa. So 135 versus 100 genes, right? Which is more than the concurrent ones. I can isolate these genes. I can just download the genes that it's affecting. I can see, is it a, are these genes that are doing the reverse in this particular study? You know, are these something I really want to target? You know, is in that cluster that I just come up with, came, you know, just found a little while ago. You can also go to the disease atlas. Now I can compare it to different cancers, right? I think this gene list, or this comparison is the most critical in that when you're doing pathway analysis, you're just pulling out what somebody thinks the genes are. Here what you're doing is you're actually taking whatever gene list you're putting in and saying it's more like this gene list in this disease. And it's based on the data and not what people talk about it. And of course kidney cancer comes up, we would expect that. But I mean the really cool thing is now you can kind of rank these. Right, I have this idealized list of papillary renal cell carcinoma. You know, what is papillary renal cell carcinoma? How is it related to other kidney cancers? Right? You look here, these are all papillary, so let me go down here. And I asked them, I asked people at Illumina, I'm like, there's no way you can calculate a 1.0 times 10 to the negative 323rd p value. They can. Jim spent like an hour explaining it to me. It was a long hour, but <laughs> they can. But again, you know, you've got papillary renal cell, you've got type one. Our list probably looks more like type one than it does to type two, even though it's a combination of both. You also, papillary renal cell carcinoma is probably more similar to clear cell than it is Williams, than it is to oncocytoma or a chromophore tumor. And you could say, well, that's just one study. And I look under here, it's giving me the same thing. Chromophores is clear cells in front. Now you have hereditary, right? More information. It's not just a gene list. Now I'm ranking it against other forms of kidney cancer, right? I'm putting it into context. And we can do this not only with um, kidney cancer, but we can see like what's related, right? I'm willing to bet that papillary renal cell carcinoma is more like liver cancer than it is gastric cancer.
And we can go to those individual studies and find that information. Or we can use it. This is the cool part. And then I'll stop. I know I'm over. I'm sorry. Was it 2.15? Is that the... Okay, <laughs> sorry. Almost done. So we can go to tissues, and obviously we would expect kidney to come up. What's interesting, though, is it's showing me that this kidney is negatively correlated. That what we're actually doing is we're looking at kidney cancer, and it's actually basically turning from a nice kidney cell back into kind of primordial ooze, right? It's, it's going back in time. What I find is really good though, is say I say, you know, I've created this gene list and I want to find a cell type that repro reproduces what I'm seeing, that I want to create. I can go to cell lines and I could say, in my experiment, here's all my kidney cancers. I'm going to use this ACH9 cell type because it, it is very similar to the gene list that I put in. Right? I would say this would be a standard kidney cancer. And if I looked down here and I saw a green one, Williams tumor cell line, I sure as heck don't want to use that. I know this is a lot of information, but let me, let me just review what we did. Is I wanted to work on papillary renal cell carcinoma. I didn't have any data myself, right? So what I did is I used Correlation Engine to basically mine all the tons and tons of free data that's out there, right? And it's a very easy tool to use and I don't have to program. I found 17 different gene lists with, comprised of eight different studies. I created a gene list out of that, basically took the average, the wisdom of crowd of all that information, came up with an idealized gene list that I think is better than each one of those individual studies, and then I put it back in here to interpret. And now I can plan all kinds of other experiments that I want to do. Maybe I want to, you know, explore how William's tumor is so different than this one. Or say I want to, maybe I get some of those cell lines and I start adding, so that in that disease, or the pharmacoatlas, the one substance that, um, that was negative, that eolin, it's a Chinese herb. It's been used in Chinese traditional medicine forever. You know, say I take that, you know, some of that extract and I start treating some of the cell lines that I find with that. See what it does. I didn't prove anything today. <laughs> I come from the bench, right? I know some of you are like, oh, that's BS, you know? That's what it is. It, this is an idea generator. Right? This is going to help you get to that. This is, you don't have to do preliminary experiments anymore. Like, this will get you there. You know, trust in the knowledge, and if you look at enough people, you know, the answers you pull out are going to be very, very valid, and they're going to be better than anything you could probably do. Because you're only, you know, I mean, these are hundreds and hundreds of different samples. You know, some of the great, you know, great labs and, you know, Great group, you know, papillary groups have done some of these. You know, you can use all that information. You can also take your own information and compare it to all of this. And I will stop there because I think people's brains are going to blow up. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Um, so this clearly is a very powerful tool for doing data analysis from a number of different research groups. Um, but some of that, like you said, would just be a starting point. However, if you found something that very strongly correlated perhaps certain gene expression to a certain disease that maybe was not captured in those studies, do you think there would be any type of ethical obligation to notify those research groups? I've tried. Usually, <laughs> I'll find all kinds of cool stuff in people's data, and I'll send them email, look, I found this, and they're just, yeah, that's nice, whatever, crazy person. <laughs> They'll just... Yeah, I don't know. And that's what I asked them, like, the Illumina people, I'm like, I'm sure you have repeat offenders that are just putting garbage out on the, you know, geo. Like, shouldn't you report them? And they're like, well, we, that's not what we do. So they just throw it away. I mean, that's right, you know, it's, there's a, there is a lot of garbage out there. Um, what I like about this and what I like about like arrays or, or the RNA-seq is you can't falsify 55,000 different things you know, 
what's on the arrays is on the arrays. And so, you know, you can interpret it any way you want, but once I look at your data, I'll know exactly what's going on. So, yeah, I, I haven't got to that point, but yeah. Yeah. What different experiment may be designed for different purposes? And we start checking those experiment design, you simply put this data together. Do you think that, you know, scientifically make any sense? You saw it, right? I mean, you saw that one gene, and you saw it was measured at a high level in all the different studies. Yeah, I mean, without checking the experimental design, uh, you just put this data together. Is that some concern? Well, it depends, right? I mean, if I was going to publish on it, I would. <laughs> if I'm messing around, not really. And I think that's what's great about this, is you can go pretty quickly. And that, what I found is, like, if I put all this together, you know, and I see a gene and I see all the, all the different studies that you see like a bunch of green bars and then one study has like a red bar and it always has a red bar on all the different studies. That study is probably garbage and I'll throw it away. I think people get uncomfortable with the fact that like, you know, that I throw stuff away and I put stuff together and I'm not really, like I said, this is an idea generator and that I use this analogy sometimes is that you know, if you're in a football game, you know, and your running back goes and he gets hit and he fumbles the ball and the other team picks it up and then he gets hit and then, you know, and there's a lateral and then it bounces off a tube in the audience and somehow comes to, you know, if, if they still score, it's still a score. <laughs> it doesn't matter how you got there. It's, it's you know, you should use the, the, your brain to help you get to this. And I think there's a lot of people out there that think that you're gonna develop an algorithm that tells you what a disease is, and it's untrue. And I also tell this story a lot in that it's true that the world's greatest chess player can get beaten by IBM's Big Blue. Everybody's heard of that, right? Big Blue, the, yeah. You know, and it's now they develop a system where, I don't know if it's Big Blue anymore, but they can beat the world's greatest Go player at Go, you know, the Chinese game. Um, but what they don't really tell you is that if that Go player, that chess player got a computer, it could beat the original computer, right? It's not man versus machine. It's if you put both of them together, they're better than both. And I think that's what this software allows you to do is you've got the human element and you've also got all the data and the computational power. Do not let an algorithm make your gene list, right? I mean, you have to do the interpretation and that's the hard part. Any other questions? All right, thank you.